Okay, uh, welcome to the lecture 10 for our deep learning course uh, in spring semester. And thank you so much uh, for, uh, for logging in. I know we are going through difficult times and your conditions may not be perfect. Um, so a few announcements. The deadline for project proposals are uh, tomorrow. This includes creation of the GitHub repository with README MD file, which contains the summary of the project. So briefly discuss what you want to do, what you want to achieve in this project. Um, and uh, late submissions or any empty README file uh, repositories uh, will lose 30 points from your uh, final, final grade for the project. And once you are done, please email, email me the link uh, to your GitHub repository before deadline. Okay. And uh, deadline for the project, um, you know, which includes the uh, report, is um, uh, April 27th. And the project presentations are going to be on 30th. Okay. You can actually read the details about the grading in our GitHub repository for this course. All right, so last week we covered data preparation for recurrent neural networks. We used a really simple um, text data and we also implemented um, recurrent neural networks from scratch. We were actually able to predict uh, what, uh, what uh, are the next uh, words or next, uh, next characters once uh, once the algorithm is given some, some text. And today we are going to cover uh, GRUs and LSTMs and also some attention mechanisms and transformers. So these are still all about sequential data in particular uh, text data set. And the source material, uh, as always, we will be using Dive into Deep Learning uh, textbook. Uh, so most of my slides are from there. And also you can find my uh, slides in our GitHub repository again. Okay, so let's first talk about the back propagation through time. Uh, now we will finally delve a bit more, more deeply into the details of back propagation for sequence models and why and how the math works. Because so far we just took it for granted. Now, Let's discuss what is really going on under the hood. And um, forward propagation in a recurrent neural network is relatively straightforward, right? Um, but back propagation through time is actually a specific application of back propagation in recurrent neural networks. So let's look at the computation graph uh, for a recurrent neural network. So we have these inputs and we have the uh, hidden states, which are all connected to each other. And we also have these weight parameters. Um, so WHX is actually the weight parameter that maps input to the hidden state. And WHH is the weight parameter that maps hidden, previous hidden state to the current hidden state. And we also have this uh, WOH or H, that maps the hidden state to, to the output. And once we compute the outputs, we check uh, our error by comparing them with the, with the true values. And then we compute this uh, loss function. And then we need to back propagate in this computation graph in order to learn these parameters, right? So let's see what happens mathematically in detail. So in a simple linear latent variable model, let's assume we don't have any activation functions, okay? So we have this input xt at time t that is multiplied by this weight matrix whx. And also we have the hidden state from previous time, which is t minus one. And uh, we multiply this with the other weight matrix whh and we compute the current hidden state, right? And once we have the current hidden state, by multiplying it with this weight matrix, WOH, we actually have the output. And finally, given this output and the, the true labels, we compute the loss, 
at each time. And this is the overall objective function. The capital L is the overall objective function, which is a function of X, Y, and W, right? And uh, derivatives with respect to WOH, which is actually in the, uh, in the final layer, uh, is pretty straightforward. So it is just a product of uh, derivative of uh, loss at each time with respect to output and also HT. But dependency on WHH and WHX is a bit tricky because it, it includes both of these uh, um, pr uh, product between the derivative of each loss function with respect to the output and WOH. And also we have this extra term, which is also, uh, which, which actually contains power of these matrices. And then we sum them up. So both for WHH and WHX, we have this complicated term for the, for the derivatives. So what are the problems with these gradients? First of all, it pays to store the intermediate results, right? So you need to store each of these um, uh, WHH. And also, even in this simple linear model, it, um, it potentially involves some very large powers of WHH. So for example, if the eigenvalues of this WHH um, are smaller than one, then it, uh, the gradients will vanish. But if it is larger than one, then it will diverge because you are taking the power of these matrices. That's why we will get numerically, numerically unstable results. Uh, and also we might um, give uh, unnecessary importance to potentially irre irrelevant past detail if we have really large gradients. And uh, one way to address this, to truncate the, uh, address this is to truncate the sum at a computational convenience size. So basically um, we can just detach the gradients uh, after some point. That's what we were doing last week. Okay, so let's talk about gated recurrent units, which are designed to solve these vanishing and divergent gradient problems. So what, what do these uh, really large or really small uh, gradients mean in practice? So we might uh, encounter a situation where an early observation is highly significant for predicting all future observations. So in that case, you may need something like a memory cell. You may want to assign some importance to the gradients um, for the early stages if, you, if there is some importance. And also there might be some situations where some symbols carry more pertinent observations. In those cases, you may want to skip such symbols. And also there might be some situations where there is a logical break between parts of a sequence. In that case, you may want to reset uh, your internal state. So there are a number of methods that have been proposed to address this. Um, one of the earliest is LSTM, which stands for long short-term memory. And the other one is the gated recurrent unit, GRU. Uh, which is a slightly more streamlined variant um, and uh, often offers uh, comparable performance to LSTMs and also it is uh, faster to compute. So what does uh, GREs do that solves our vanishing uh, and diverging um, gradient problems? So in GREs we have dedicated mechanism for when the uh, hidden state should be updated and also when it should be reset. So there's a mechanism that says, okay, now I'm ready to update or there's a mechanism that says, now it is time to reset. And these mechanisms can be learned. For example, if the first symbol is of great importance, we will learn not to update the hidden state after the first observation. Or we will learn to skip irrelevant temporary observations or we will learn to reset the latent state whenever is needed. 
So for this, um, GRIS introduced uh, reset gates and update gates. Uh, we engineer them to be vectors with entries zero and one such that we can perform convex combinations of these uh, gates. For example, a reset variable would allow us to control how much of the previous state we might still want to remember. And likewise, an update variable would allow us to control how much of the new state is just a copy of the old state. So in this figure, for example, we have this input xt and we have the hidden state that comes from the previous um, time, time step. So we have the reset, uh, reset gate, RT, that can, that's the output of um, this input time some weight matrices and also previous hidden state, some weight matrices, and also the bias term. And we have this uh, nonlinear function. And these weights are also learned. WXR and WHR are also learned. And these are the parameters for the reset gate that you will uh, have. And ZT is the update gate. So it also takes XT, your input, and multiplies it by WXC. And also it takes the previous hidden state, HT minus one, and multiplies it by WHC and uh, adds this bias term. And after having this, um, okay. Okay, so, so after having this, um, so in a conventional RNN, you would have an update of this form, right? So we will have the input XT multiplied by WXH and previous uh, hidden state t minus one and multiply by whh and um, we have this bias term. So if you want to be able to reduce the influence of the previous states, we can multiply this ht minus term with uh, rt, the reset gate, element wise. So whenever the entries of rt are close to one, we recover a conventional deep RNA. So imagine multiplying this with RT, actually here maybe we should look. So if RT is always one, then the result will be equivalent to the original RNA or conventional deep RNA. Um, but for all entries of RT that are close to zero, the hidden state is, is the result of an MLP uh, with XT as input. So in that case, this, uh, if this is all zero, it will all be, it will all vanish, this term will vanish, and then the result will be just the regular multilayer perceptron with input XT. So basically this leads to the following candidate for a new hidden state. So we can, instead of having this HT, we can have a candidate HT tilde um, that has, that can be written as in this equation. Okay, so in this figure, we have this reset gate and also update gate we didn't talk about update gate yet. So the reset gate, we take the previous hidden state and we take the reset gate and multiply them and then pass them through a tan h function. And then we finally get the candidate hidden state, ht tilde, okay? And update gate, uh, determines the extent to which the new state HT is just the old state HT minus one and by how much the new candidate state HT tilde is used. So basically uh, the gating variable, so we have ZT for the update gate, um, can be used for this purpose that leads to the final update equation is written here. So we have the candidate gate HT tilde and we have the previous gate, and we have this update gate ZT and one minus ZT. So if ZT is close to one, that means just use the previous hidden state. If ZT is close to zero, then that means use the candidate state. So you can see that uh, this ZT, uh, ZT is multiplied by HT minus one here in this node, 
And also one minus ZT is multiplied with the candidate hidden state and we sum them up to output HT. Okay, so by using this reset gate and update gate, we are actually kind of learning when to update our hidden state. So to summarize, GREs have the following two distinguishing features. Reset gates help capture short-term dependencies in time series, and update gates help capture long-term dependencies in time series. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's move to the uh, other other algorithm or actually architecture that is used uh, for the same purpose, long short-term memory, LSTM. It actually shares many of the properties of the gated recurrent units, um, but it, its design is a little bit more complicated. And it's actually inspired by logic gates of a computer. So to control a memory cell, we need a number of gates. Um, one gate is needed to read out the entries from the cell that is called output gate. And the second gate is needed to decide when to read data into the cell, which is called input gate. And lastly, we need a mechan mechanism to reset the contents of the cell, which is called forget gate. Um, so, Let's talk about the gated memory cells or input gates, forget gates, and output gates in LSTMs. So the gates are defined as follows. So the input gate is defined as IT, which is this one. And the forget gate is defined as FT. And the output gate is defined as OT. And the gates are defined, uh, and the equations can be written as follows. So each of them is actually a new, um, uh, you, you can think each of them as a new layer. So for example, in order to get IT, the input gate, we take the input XT, multiply it by some weight matrices, and then we take the previous hidden state, HT minus one, and multiply it by another weight matrix, and we have the bias term. And we do the same things for FT and OT, but each of them have these uh, different weight matrices uh, that we want to learn during our training. And um, the candidate memory cell is defined as this. So we have input XT again, and there's another weight matrix. And um, we also have the previous HT minus one and we multiply it by, um, by, by another uh, weight matrix, and we have the bias term. So in GRS, we had a single mechanism to, to govern input and forgetting. Here, we actually have two parameters, IT, which governs how much we take new data into account via CT, uh, CT tilde, and the forget parameter FT, which addresses how much uh, how much of the old, uh, how, how much of this, uh, the old memory cell we retain. So for example, CT can be defined as CT minus one, the previous um, memory cell multiplied by the forget. So if forget is one, you actually forget uh, the memory cells value or memory cell state at T minus one. And um, then the input is you, you allow this uh, candidate memory cell to go through. So if input um, memory, if the value of the input gate is one, you, you actually use this uh, candidate memory cell. So you can see all of this uh, here too. So we have the previous hidden state and we have the input and we have the forget state and we also have the previous uh, memory. And um, this forget gate is multiplied by memory cell. So if forget is one, um, we actually take the CT minus one. If forget is zero, then um, we completely forget CT minus one. And we also have this input that actually is multiplied 
with the candidate memory C tilde, C, C T tilde, and um, it is uh, multiplied. Yeah, so it, this input gate is multiplied with, with C T tilde, and then we sum them up like down here, and then um, we we decide for C T based on these values of F T and I T. And um, finally, we need to define how to compute the hidden state, right? So we, we still didn't discuss how to uh, compute this H, HT here. Um, so this is where the output gate, gate uh, comes into play. So basically we take this CT that we decided based on the candidate memory and the uh, previous memory says, and then uh, we pass it through some 10H uh, nonlinear function, and um, we uh, we out, um, we multiply it with the output gate, which is also a result of some other uh, multiplications with the weight matrices and also addition with bias term. Then we output this ht. Okay, so whenever the output gate is one, so if this is one, we effectively pass all memory information through the predictor, but if uh, output gate is zero, we retain all information only within the memory cell, in, only in CT, and we do not perform any uh, further processing. Okay, so basically we, we kind of um, allow how much of memory we want, to, uh, we want to output and also how much of hidden state we want to uh, let, the, let the cell to take. Okay, so any questions so far about LSTMs or GRUs? Okay, anyways. Okay, thank you for your response. Um, all right, let's talk about um, uh, deep uh, recurrent neural networks. So far, we only had a single hidden layer in our RNN um, architectures in our codes that we did last week. So now let's consider, consider a deep recurrent neural network with L hidden layers. So instead of having only one hidden layer here, we can actually have L of these and then we can output uh, from, from these hidden layers. So basically each hidden state is continuous to pass to the next time step of the current layer and the next layer of the current time step. So for example, HT1 can be defined as, the, as a function of the input XT and the previous, um, uh, previous um, hidden state. And then hidden state uh, at layer L is, um, uh, is a function of, is some function of current um, current hidden state at uh, layer L minus one, and also um, hidden states of L in the previous time. So it's actually, you either change uh, this T or L, okay? And the output is a function of this uh, the last uh, hidden state. So far, we assume that our goal is to model the next world given what we have seen so far. Um, and of course, this is the typical scenario. We also mentioned uh, causality. It makes more sense to learn future based on past because whatever happens in future doesn't actually affect past. But um, uh, there might be uh, cases, especially in text, that uh, it's not the only one, it's not the only scenario that we might encounter. So for example, uh, let's consider the following three tasks of filling in the, in the blanks in a text. So in one we have, I am blank. And the second one is, I am blank, very hungry. In the third one, I am blank, very hungry, I could eat half a pig. So clearly the end of, of the phrase conveys significant information about which word to pick, right? So if, if I don't use any of these uh, words that I see on the right side of this blank, uh, I might come up with something really illogical, right? So by using both um, the previous words and also the words after 
uh, whatever blank we have, we can actually make a more accurate uh, filling of the words. So that's when you, want, you may want to use bidirectional recurrent neural networks. So um, how do they work? Uh, instead of running, can, um, running a recurrent neural network only in forward mode, starting from the first symbol, um, we start another one from the last symbol, running back to front. So basically, um, before we only we were only forwarding this direction. Now we also have this um, direction of uh, layers. Okay, so basically we can define hidden states from left to right, uh, like this, for example, it still takes the input xt and we have some weights that we want to learn. And it also takes the previous hidden state that goes in the same direction and uh, multiplied by some parameters, whh, and we have the bias term. And now we want to um, compute the same thing just in the other direction. So we have ht that goes from right to left in this case, we also take xt, the input, but we have different set of uh, parameters. So these parameters are for forward, these parameters are for backward. And we use the uh, hidden state from t plus one instead of t because we are going from left to right. And we also have this bias term. And when you output, you can uh, just use this um, HT that, uh, that has both of these uh, hidden states and multiply it by weight and add some uh, bias term. Okay. And uh, now let's talk about encoder decoder architecture. It is actually a, a neural network design pattern. And the encoder's role is uh, encoding the inputs into state, which often contains some several tensors then the state is passed to the, to the decoder to generate outputs. Okay, so we have this in, input, we have encoder, which is usually some other uh, neural network, and we have the state, and from the state, we pass it to the decoder to generate output. So in machine translation, the encoder transforms a source sentence, for example, hello world, into some state, some vector, okay? so here hello world comes and there is some neural network here and now uh, we represent our hello world as a vector with numbers uh, to capture its semantic information and then uh, from the decoder uh, we can actually output a translated target sen sentence for example if you are uh, translating from english to uh, french this um, hello world might become Benjamin Le Monde. Um, excuse me for my French, but I think you got the idea, right? So basically here we hope that we can encode some semantic information of our source um, input to actually translate it to some different form of, a, of a, uh, output that shares the same semantic information, of course. Um, and sequence to sequence or sick to sick model is based on the encoder decoder architecture, architecture to generate a sequence output for a sequence input. So both the encoder and the decoder use recurrent neural networks to handle sequence inputs. Uh, and the hidden state of the encoder is used directly to initialize the decoder hidden state to pass information from the encoder to the decoder, okay? So for example, in this figure, we have hello world, and we have a period here, and we, um, we represent um, our, our sequence in some hidden state, and our decoder actually initializes its own, uh, own state with this, um, from the output of the encoder, and then we can actually start uh, outputting um, the, um, the words that we want to translate our input into. So for example, here, the, the first entry in decoder takes the hidden state output from decoder, and it also has this input, which means beginning of the sentence, okay? 
So given this hidden state and this input you have from here, it outputs bonjour. And then we input this bonjour as an input to the next state. And um, also we use the previous hidden state from decoder and that outputs le. And then we use this le as an input to the next uh, cell in the decoder and use the hidden here and monde. And finally, uh, once we see uh, the period, then we can actually output end of a sentence. So it stops here. So this is, uh, this is one of the primitive ways for uh, machine translation, okay? So this, this is, uh, this is um, MXNet code so from the book. So basically it takes, um, so it is, it is for the encoder. It takes the vocabulary size, embedding size, number of hidden, number of layers, and you define um, embedding here, and you also define the RNN, okay? Um, so for embedding, uh, don't worry about it so much. Just think that you are representing them as vectors. We are gonna have more discussion about embeddings, but let's say we have axes here, and then we pass them through some uh, RNN, and we have the output and state. So this part is actually not that different than what we discussed last, last week. This is just forward propagation of an RNN in the encoder. Um, so for example, if you define an encoder like this, so let's say our input is four by seven dimensional matrix. And then when we define, uh, when we pass this input X through through our encoder, we get an output and state. And in the output, output shape is actually seven times four times 16. Here 16 is because of the number of hidden, uh, hidden uh, uh, unit, number of hidden units is 16, okay? And remember, we also um, changed the uh, dimensions of the, of the number of steps and number of batch. So here X was um, four was the batch size, seven was the number of steps. And we also uh, swap it in our RNN. And um, decoder part is actually more interesting. So the, the main part here is that when you initialize the state, for example, when you initialize encoder, you just, um, Okay, so we just say begin state. So that begin state was random, if you remember from last week. But now, actually, we initialize... Um, yeah, when you, when you say initialize state, it actually takes the outputs of the encoder. Okay? Um, and... Uh, in the, in the forward propagation, we also add this dense layer with the hidden, hidden size to be the vocabulary size. And this is how you call it using the MXNet function, MXNet uh, library. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So we have the sick to sick model um, that uh, works like this, and it is, uh, it is used for machine translation mostly. All right, so now let's um, move to a different con concept, uh, but for the same problem called attention mechanism. Uh, so far, we encode the source sequence input information in the recurrent unit state, and then pass it to the decoder to generate the target sequence, right? So a token in the target sequence may closely relate to some tokens in the source sequence instead of the whole source sequence. For example, when you translate hello world to bonjour le monde, bonjour maps to hello and monde maps to world. So in the sick to sick model, the decoder may implicitly select the corresponding information from the state passed to the decoder. But, um, Attention mechanism makes this selection more explicit. So basically, when we see hello, we want to emphasize bonjour more. Okay, we know that 
uh, hello will be related to this word bonjour in French. So that's why we should pay more attention to it. So attention is actually a generalized pooling method uh, with bias alignment over inputs. So the core component in the attention mechanism is the attention, attention layer. So an input of the attention layer is called a query. Okay, so we input this query. And for a query, the attention layer returns the output based on its memory. And its memory is a set of keys and values. So this is, so you can think this, um, this box is like the uh, memory part that represents our attention layer. And then we have our query. And then based on our query and our memory, we actually output a result. Um, so let's say this query is um, represented by Q, which is uh, the Q dimensional, and the memory contains n key value pairs, K1, V1, all the way up to K and V n. And here each uh, K i can be the K dimensional and V i can be the V dimensional. And the essential layer returns an output of uh, D V. Okay. So let's see how to compute the output in attention layer. So to compute the output, we first assume there is a score function. Let's call it alpha, okay? And this alpha measures the similarity between the query and the key. Then we compute uh, all n scores a1 to an by this. So we have ai based on some, uh, some score function, alpha. So we take our query and we also um, take each ki to compute each ai, okay? And next we use softmax to obtain the attention weights. So basically we just uh, pass them through uh, a softmax function and let's call it b1 to bn. And then the output is the weighted sum of these values. So we take each value from our memory, vi, and um, compute the weighted sum of these vi's uh, with respect to these attention weights, vi's, okay? And of course, different choices of the score function lead to different attention layers. So, for example, here you can see what is going on. So we have these keys and we have the query. And then given this query and the keys, we compute the attention weights. And then once we have the attention weights, we actually take our values and take a weighted sum of these and then we compute our output. So basically, instead of using this query in our model, we actually use this output that's uh, kind of weighted sum of what you have seen in your memory. And um, you can use uh, that product as a score function, uh, but it is, assumes that the query has the same dimension as the keys. So basically both the Q and Ki are d-dimensional and it computes the score by an inner product between the query and the key and often divided by uh, square root of d to make the scores less sensitive to the dimension d. So basically, if, the, if this alpha score function is defined as a dot product, um, alpha of q and k is defined as this um, dot product between q and k and normalized by the square root of the dimension of these vectors. So, if you have more than a single query, for example, let's say your Q is a matrix, which is M by D dimensional. In other words, it contains M queries. And let's say you have the um, key, which is also a matrix and it is N by D dimensional and it has N keys. We can actually compute uh, M times N scores by this formulation. Okay, so, so far we defined how attention works when you use a dot product as a score function. Uh, well, 
you don't have to use score function. We have been using uh, neural networks for everything. So why not use the same thing to compute your score function? So you can uh, use multilayer perceptron attention. We basically first project both queries uh, and keys into some, um, some uh, H-dimensional space and given learnable parameters, WK, WQ, and V, the sc score function can be defined as um, WK times the key plus WQ times Q, and you pass them through some tan H function, and you also uh, take the, uh, that product with the V function. And these are, so each, all of these three variables here are actually learnable parameters by your model. Okay, so how is that related to the sequence to sequence uh, models? Um, so we can actually add this attention mechanism to the seek to seek models. Um, and the memory of the attention layer consists of the encoder outputs of each time step. So during decoding the, the decoder outputs from the previous time step, and it is used as the query. And the attention output is then fed into the decoder. So for example, uh, if, you, if you remember our previous discussion about seek to seek, we actually didn't have this attention layer at all, right? So all we had was like encoder here, and we were hoping encoder to actually uh, output some meaningful latent space. And we were just using that, uh, that um, hidden state as an input to our decoder. But now, actually with attention, we are using all those intermediate hidden states too. Because why should you use just the final hidden state? Why can't you take advantage of all the previous hidden states in your seek to seek model? Um, so let's actually illustrate this um, using whiteboard. I hope it will work. Share. Okay. So a little bigger. Nice. Okay. So let's say we want to translate um, the English sentence "I love you" to a Korean um, correspondence. Which means non no sarak hey. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's just probably very unlikely, so I apologize if you speak Korean. Um, so, what did we have before? So, for example, if we had an encoder, like this, do you guys see? Um, okay, let's see. The, okay, perfect, perfect, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so let's say this is our encoder, okay? And let's say, okay, so let's say here I have, I love you. Okay, so this is an encoder, and then I pass it, uh, I use the, okay, so th these are all connected, right? So this is a recurrent neural network. And um, then, um, so we have this, um, let's call this a context vector. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry, it is not really uh, very pretty, but I hope you get the idea. And then we input this to our uh, decoder. So let's type decoder here. Uh, so the decoder takes our context vector, okay? And other input to my decoder is, let's say, I say, start okay. 
And um, then, so based on this context vector, and this uh, start is an input to the, to the first uh, cell in my decoder, hopefully it will return this Korean word that means I, so it is none. Okay, and then the second cell in my decoder, so it will use this hidden state from the decoder. Okay, sorry, I, I have a uh, guest here. Um, she's having uneasy times. Um, okay, so I have this hidden state and then I also out input the output of the first cell here, okay, and then uh, hopefully it will learn, what is the second word here, null, so this actually means you, not, not null in Korean, and then I pass this as an input to the next cell, and I also use this um, hidden state to actually output Oh, uh, Sarah K. So this means love in Korean. And um, finally, so when it uh, in our model sees this Sarah K, and also based on the hidden structure, it says it is the end of my sentence. So it stops here. So this is how seek to seek model works to translate I love you to, to the I love you in Korean, okay? So by using attention in seek to seek, actually instead of having a single context vector here, we will also be using all these hidden states from these previous, previous cells in our, in our encoder. Okay, so let's see how it's, how it works. Um, so maybe I should, I should erase some of it. All right, so now, I will have, uh, oh, I didn't know I could use this. Nice, so this is hidden state one, hidden state two, hidden state three, okay? And uh, can I actually even type this? Okay. Sorry, I never used this before. Um, actually, I think I'll just draw myself. Okay, so this is hidden state one, hidden state two, and hidden state three, okay? And then I pass them through some attention mechanism. So, um, Okay. Okay, so let's say here compute. Compute scores. So now my keys are actually H1, H2, H3. And what is my query? My query is first going to be the output of this. So basically it's going to be H3 here. So let's make it H3. So I compute it, I pass it here, okay? And then I compute the scores and the scores are going to be, so based on some, um, some score function, they are going to be S1, 
phase two. And S3. Okay. Okay. And then after I complete scores, remember I need to pass them to some softmax function. So let's call it. Softmax. Oh, yeah, my handwriting is even worse here, but I hope you get it. So this is the softmax function. And from softmax function, we actually compute these um, uh, A1, A2, so basically attention weights. Actually, in our slides, they, we call them B1, so let's stick with our notation. So I am going to have B1 here. How do I move this? Okay. So I have B2 here. And B3 here. Okay. And then uh, I compute a new context vector. So instead of using just H3 as a context vector, I actually have weighted some of these H1, H2, H3 here. So let's call it compute. context vector um, and then let's uh, call it context vector CV okay so now I have, I need to uh, define my decoder. So my decoder actually uses this context vector. So, oh, where's my eraser? I don't need this part. And I can continue drawing. So here in my decoder, I am going to use this context vector is like, input for the hidden state and then I'm going to have start here okay and hopefully it will output uh, none okay and it's going to output a hidden state too so uh, instead of Instead of feeding this hidden state directly to the to the next cell, we actually use our uh, attention layer that we defined here. So in this case, instead of having this CV, so we don't need this CV anymore, and the query is not going to be previous HT. So now the new query is going to be this one. So let's take this query put it to our memory cell and then uh, based on the score function between this um, between this memory and our query which is the output of the hidden state we will have a new uh, context vector and then we are going to input that convex context vector And also use this num as an other input. We are going to output uh, something else. So here, uh, okay, it's getting a little bit 
crowded, but let me know if you get confused. So here our output is going to be null. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm actually going to, so instead of using the previous uh, hidden state as a query, I'm going to remove this part and I'm going to compute the new query. by inputting this to the memory cell and compute new uh, context vector. And then instead of having that context vector here, I will actually input it to the, to the next, next cell. So now the context vector will come here. And also, I will also use null here. I don't need this anymore. And finally, it will output um, the Korean word for love, which was Sarangke. Okay, so basically what we are doing is instead of uh, taking the previous hidden layer, uh, yeah, hidden state, every time we pass our hidden state back to our attention layer, compute a new uh, context vector and use it as an input for the hidden state in the next, uh, uh, next uh, cell. But we start doing it at the end of the encoder, right? So first we need to have all these hidden states from our encoder and then uh, have our um, memory cell for the attention layer. And every time we pass it from the output uh, of the encoder, we keep using this attention layer to compute the scores to basically pay um, attention to which of these hidden states. Okay, so that's the uh, basic idea of attention in seek to seek models. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, um, let's move back to our slides. Okay, we did this. Uh, so if you want to learn more about seek to seek models with attention mechanism, you can actually read um, this uh, paper that was the first published in, uh, in combining seek to seek with the attention mechanism. And okay, so, so far we covered um, commercial neural networks a few weeks ago and also RNNs um, last week. So let's first recap the pros and cons. So first, CNNs are easy to parallelize at a layer, but they cannot capture sequential dependency very well. And RNNs, on the other hand, are able to capture the long range variable length sequential information, but they suffer from inability to parallelize within a sequence. So these seek to seek models uh, with attention layers, yeah, they are good, but uh, they, they are not cheap to train because of the recurrent neural networks. You need to use the recurrent neural network to, uh, to model it. So these um, authors uh, from Google uh, for the paper, Attention is All You Need, actually combine the advantages from both uh, RNNs and CNNs to design a novel architecture using the attention mechanism. So transformer achieves parallelization by capturing recurrent sequence with attention and at the same time encodes each item's position in the sequence. So instead of uh, using recurrent neural network, it actually encodes the, uh, the location of a sequence, okay? The position of a sequence. So um, transformer model is also based on the encoder-decoder architecture like uh, stick-to-stick models. 
but it replaces the recurrent layers in sick to sick with multi-hat attention layers. So each item in the sequential is copied as the query, key, and value. And uh, we call such an attention also as a self-attention layer. So uh, this is an illustration of a transformer. So the source sequence uh, embeddings are fed into and repeated blocks. So each of them is a transformer block and you can have several of those, both in the encoder and also the decoder, okay? And the output of the last block are then used as attention memory for the decoder. So we take the output and then it is the attention memory in the decoder, okay? And the target sequence embeddings are similarly fed into the, um, uh, into and repeated blocks in the decoder too. So we have these N of these two. And the final op outputs are obtained uh, by, by applying a dense layer with a vocabulary size to the last blocks uh, outputs. And if you notice, there are actually some near layers that we didn't discuss before. So we have this positional encoding that we will talk about. We have multi-head attention and we have add and not. So uh, if we compare transformer to sick to sick models, we have these three new items. So the transformer block, uh, it's a recurrent layer in the sick, so, sorry, a recurrent layer in the sick to sick is replaced by this transformer block. And it contains a multi-head attention layer like this, and also a network with position wise feed forward, oops, sorry. Um, it also contains a position-wise feed-forward network layers in the encoder. And in a, another multi-hat attention layer is used to take the encoder state into the decoder here. And we also have this ATAM norm. The, so the inputs and outputs of both the multi-hat attention layer or the position-wise feed-forward network are processed by two uh, add and uh, norm layer that contains both the residual structure. So if you, if you remember ResNets, we, all, we had the residual structure there too. So here we had the residual similar idea uh, for the residual structure and it also has the normalization um, layer. Okay, so it actually normalizes the uh, features. And we also have this position encoding, which is uh, different than sick to sick models. And um, um, this um, positional encoding layer is used to add sequential information into each sequence item. So before talking about multi-hat attention, let's talk a little bit about uh, self-attention. So self-attention is a normal attention model uh, with its uh, query, its um, key, and its value being copied exactly the same from each item of the sequential input. So imagine we have this sequential input at time t minus one, t and t plus one, and we copy the query key and value for each sequence. And uh, self-attention outputs the same sequential output for each input item. So if you have, um, uh, so whatever dimension you have here, uh, you have the same, uh, same length output here. And uh, compared to the recurrent layer, output items of a self-attention layer can be computed in parallel. So this is actually the beat of this. So you don't really, so in RNN, you cannot really um, compute the uh, uh, weights uh, in, um, in parallel. You need to do it sequentially. But here, since everything is a matrix uh, multiplication, we can just, um, uh, parallelize all this computation. That's why it is faster than the sick to sick models that use uh, recurrent layers. And uh, multi attention layer consists of H parallel self attention layers. So each one is called, uh, called a hat. So instead of having one self attention, we have, uh, we have H of these. Okay. So each of them is uh, one self attention here. And the output of these H attention uh, hats are concatenated and then passed by a final dance layer. 
And um, the, uh, another feature of uh, transformer is position-wise feedforward networks, FFN. Uh, so it accepts uh, 3D input with shape batch size by sequence length by feature size. And um, uh, position-wise, um, FFN um, consists of two dense layers that applies to the last dimension. So it is actually applied in the feature size in, in the third dimension. Um, and uh, since uh, the same two dense layers are used for each position item in this sequence, we refer to it as uh, position-wise. So what do we mean by this? So let's say we have a position-wise layer, which is four by eight dimensional. Oh, sorry, so it's not for, these are the inputs. Um, so I think um, here four must be the output dimension, uh, but uh, for now, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, so first, um, oh, okay, sorry. I think I, I know what it is. So here four is the input dimension and eight is the output dimension. So whatever your feature size, your input feature size is four and your output feature size is eight. And then let's say we input two by three by four dimensional matrix uh, or tensor uh, to, to this uh, network. So here two is actually the batch size and three is the um, step size and four is the feature size. So when we apply this FFN to this input, the output is going to be two by three by eight. So two is because of the batch size, um, three is because of the uh, sequence length. So our sequence length is three, that's why our output will have this three dimension. But for the feature dimension, actually we map four to eight. That's why, so if we just look at the first result, because our batch is two dimensional, so let's just look at the um, first item in this batch. So here, this is the first sequence, this is the second element of the sequence, and this is the third element of the sequence, and each of them is eight dimensional, and they, are, they all have the same value because our inputs are the same. And since they are sharing the weights, we are getting exactly the same values. And um, that's why it is uh, much easier to parallelize. Okay, so we talked about multi-head attention in transformer and position-wise feed-forward networks. Now let's talk about the uh, add norm layer, um, which can be seen here, both in encoder and decoder, we have it. So add and norm within the block connects inputs and outputs of other layers basically more smoothly, kind of the same idea as ResNet. So we add a layer that contains residual structure and also a layer normalization after both the multi-head attention, after multi-head attention and also position-wise FFN. And uh, layer normalization part is uh, pretty much similar to batch normalization, but one difference is that the mean and variances for the layer normalizations are calculated along the last dimension, okay? So in batch normalization, we were computing them along the batch, but here we compute mean and variance along the last dimension. So it's kind of uh, uh, like applying one by one convolutional uh, operation, convolutional layer. And uh, last, the uh, positional encoding. So uh, we discussed about uh, uh, add norm, multi-head attention, and also uh, uh, the, uh, feed forward. But now we, we didn't discuss how to encode the position because if we are not using recurrent neural networks, how can our um, network understand the sequential information? Um, so yeah, so both multi-hat layer and position-wise feed forward layer compute the output of each item in the sequence independently. So they don't know how correlated they are. And uh, it is good because it enables us to parallelize the computation, but it fails to model the sequential information for a given sequence. So to capture the sequence, the transformer model uses the positional encoding, okay? So let's assume we have input X, which is L by D dimensional, and this is the embedding of a single example. 
and let's say L is the sequence length. For example, if you say, I love you, it is three, and uh, D is the embedding size. So it is uh, how many, uh, what is the dimension of the embedding vector you are using to represent each of your work. And the position encoding layer encodes axis position by this matrix P, which is also by, which is also L by D dimensional, and the output is P plus uh, X, okay? So it basically just adds the output of this um, positional encoding uh, to, to the input. So instead of using X, we use X plus P. And now the question is how to compute this P? How can we encode the positions um, of, uh, of these element, elements in the sequence? Um, so this uh, position matrix P is a 2D matrix where each row refers to the position along the um, position along the vector dimension and each column refers to the position along the embedding dimension. Okay, so it is like uh, our input is also sequence, length, sequence size by embedding size. So our position encoding matrix is the same dimension. And um, the authors of Transformer used, um, uh, used this equation uh, based on sine and cosines to actually um, to, to encode the uh, sequential information. For example, for each i and two j, we will have um, this uh, sine function. And uh, for i and two j plus one, we will use this cosine function. So for example, let's say our input is, um, let's say our um, embedding size is 20 and our uh, sequence length is 100. So basically it is um, 20 by 100, okay? So when it is, or maybe we should look at P. So it is, this, is, this part is 20, this part is 100 and let's, plot each of these, um, um, these uh, embedding uh, vectors along, along the, uh, along the, uh, the um, not the embedding, but the sequence length. So for example, if you look at dimension four, it will look like this. If you look at dimension five, it will look like this. Okay, so these are all sines and cosines. So if you, um, if you actually rotate this figure, you can think it as like a P matrix. Okay, um, all right, so we covered, um, so today we covered LSTMs and GRUs to, um, to mitigate the problem of vanishing and exploding gradients in RNNs. And we also talked about sick to sick models um, and also uh, sick to sick models with um, attention. And after that, we actually moved to the transformer as a, as a new architecture. Um, I think I will stop here. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so next week we will continue with um, how to do embedding because so far we just assumed our embeddings are perfect and we only focused on the models, but how should we do embeddings? We, we just assumed we were using one hot encoding, but clearly it cannot capture uh, the semantics of a, of a language. So we will discuss uh, the ways about how to do it. And if we have time, we might also talk about some um, some more modern computer vision problems. Okay, everyone, uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I will share this uh, recording with you. And um, yeah, stay healthy. Uh, email me if you have any questions, okay? Thank you.